Hey everybody, it's Tom Woods. I want to take aim at this article in the American Spectator by Jeffrey Lord that is making the rounds all over the internet. Apparently it was read aloud on Rush Limbaugh's program. Mark Levin, big surprise, is pushing it. And even Michael Medved, I thought was smarter than this, is pushing this article. And really what it's trying to say is that Ron Paul is a vaguely sinister figure, and in fact really on issues that matter, particularly foreign policy, is really just a left liberal, that he's not a conservative, he's a left liberal. Now, really, at some level, who cares about these stupid labels? But when people are wrong, I like to correct them, and that's what I want to do here. So I'm going to start going through this article point by point. This is an article that we're told is devastating to the Ron Paul position. I, I, I don't know who thinks this. Uh, not anybody who knows any U.S. history, but let's go through it. So first, we're told that Ron Paul touts his admiration for the Founding Fathers, but even that is very selective. So right away the implication is that Ron Paul says he likes the Founding Fathers, but he only picks and chooses from them. Well, to a certain extent, how could you not? The Founding Fathers are not some homogeneous blob who all believed the same thing. They believed in mutually contradictory things. Some of them believed you could be thrown in jail, rightly, for criticizing the U.S. president. Others thought that that was unconstitutional. How could you hold both opinions at once? You've got to pick and choose among those. I mean, don't, don't forget, after all, as Kevin Gutzman reminds us, Aaron Burr, who was one of the important Jeffersonians of his day, shot Alexander Hamilton dead. So the idea that the Founding Fathers could be embraced in their entirety is ludicrous and nonsensical and ahistorical. I mean, nobody who knows any history at all could make an argument like that. So, for example, with Alexander Hamilton, are we going to embrace everything Hamilton believed? Are we going to embrace the idea that we should have a president who served for life, senators who served for life, governors appointed by the president, that uh, we should indeed imprison people for criticizing the president, this is covered under common law? Are these ideas that you want to hold, Jeffrey Lord? Well, if not, then I guess you're being pretty selective with the Founding Fathers, too. This whole thing is just stupid, so let's just move on. I'll mention, by the way, one quick thing. Russell Kirk said that Alexander Hamilton doesn't even qualify as a conservative. And if you don't know who Russell Kirk is, unfortunately, that probably means that you, you listen to these radio hosts. Russell Kirk was the most important conservative thinker of the 20th century, probably. and He, he deliberately excludes Hamilton from the conservative pantheon for a variety of reasons. Okay, we're told that Washington, as a general, invaded Canada. So Washington was an interventionist, unlike that mamby-pamby Ron Paul. Well, and when Jeffrey Lord went and defended his article, he then elaborated on this point and said, look, the Americans were engaged in a war against the British, and yet Washington invaded Canada. So that goes to show he's a national greatness conservative like us who goes, engages in foreign interventions at the drop of a hat. But Canada and Britain were not exactly two distinct powers. Canada was part of the British Empire at the time. And Canada had been used as a staging ground for attacks on Americans during the War for Independence. This is apparently news to our, our author. All right, and then we get this argument that the left, left liberals support non-intervention, not conservatives. So therefore, if Ron Paul favors a non-interventionist foreign policy, the foreign policy of minding your own business, this makes him a left liberal. All right, well, if, if we want to play that game, by the same token, I could say there are plenty of left liberals who support intervention. How about Lyndon Johnson, or Bill Clinton, or Hillary Clinton, or Madeleine Albright, or Howard Stern, for that matter, or Bill Richardson, or the New York Times, which was entirely in favor of both wars against Iraq, as was the Washington Post, so I can play that game, too, and say Jeffrey Lord's a left liberal. Now where are we? Now what have we accomplished? And to the contrary, the non-interventionists were the conservatives. One of the great 20th century historians, William Luchtenberg, in a famous article, pointed out that when you look at the anti-imperialist movement after 1898, he says the burden of that anti-imperialist movement was being carried by the conservatives. The left liberals, by and large, were all in favor of the Spanish-American War, and they were all in favor of World War I. The non-socialist left was all in favor of U.S. intervention in, into World War I, but with very few, just a handful of exceptions. They loved that war. They loved 
carrying out international righteousness. They knew that war is about the least conservative thing imaginable, as the Founding Fathers pointed out. They knew that it would be a great opportunity to introduce the principle of national economic planning. So, Jeffrey Lord, you are in some terrific company yourself. Basically, the whole, the whole slate of left liberals took your position. Uh, I might also point out that Robert Taft was referred to as Mr. Republican in his day. He comes in for some criticism here, because supposedly Robert Taft was just being a left liberal when he cautioned about constant military interventions. Well, first of all, Russell Kirk uh, and James McClellan wrote a book about the political principles of Robert Taft, and they went out of their way to explain that these are the correct positions of a conservative. And Russell Kirk was a non-interventionist, uh, especially toward the end of his life. I've written about this, and I'll give you a link to this at the end of this video. But Kirk was very clear about this. Richard Weaver was not a militarist. He was one of the most important conservatives of the post-war period. Felix Morley was one of the founders of Human Events Newspaper, was a, uh, a non-interventionist. Human Events is one of the most important conservative newspapers, well, basically ever. Uh, Robert Nisbet is considered one of the great traditionalist conservatives of the post-war period, and he thought it was laughable that conservatism had come to be associated with large military budgets. This is just the opposite. Of, uh, of what it ought to be and what it historically has been. But in fact, Taft was condemned by the left-wing Nation magazine for his non-interventionism. They did not say, hey, good for you, Robert Taft, you're just like us, you favor non-intervention. No, to the contrary, the Nation did the, the usual red-baiting of anybody who was skeptical of the garrison and, and warfare states. Now, this is not to mention the, the other, the old right congressman like Senator Kenneth Wery, uh, Congressman Howard Buffett, who was no left liberal, uh, he was a non-interventionist, Congressman George Butler. And so we're told throughout this article that it's only left liberals or left liberal Republicans who were in favor of non-intervention. But uh, is, is that true of Hamilton Fish or General Robert Wood or Herbert Hoover or George Holden Tinkham or others I, I might mention? So this this whole line of argument that people who don't know any history think is a home run for Jeffrey Lord fails and falls flat, falls on its face completely. Okay, and then, of course, we get the claim of anti-Semitism. This comes up all the time. You know, when you can't win an argument, you just call people names. You try to use these career-destroying smears like anti-Semite. Well, how do they claim Ron Paul's an anti-Semite? This obviously kindly man who hasn't got a hateful bone in his body, as these people obviously know, they're not stupid enough to actually think he's an anti-Semite. They just want to destroy him. Well, so what's the argument? Well, you look in this article, and it's this super long, convoluted ar argument that eventually winds up back with Ron Paul. And here's the whole argument. Well, Ron Paul, in one of his books, recommended a book by John T. Flynn. And John T. Flynn, if you go through this convoluted series of steps, it was a, it's alleged, is an anti-Semite. John T. Flynn? An anti-Semite, the same John T. Flynn who criticized Charles Lindbergh's famous September 1941 speech in Des Moines, in which he singled out the Jews as one of three groups pushing for war in Europe. That John T. Flynn? The same John T. Flynn who was critical of Father Coughlin, whom, as you know, was highly vituperative uh, against the Jews. That John T. Flynn? The John T. Flynn, whom all conservatives loved because he wrote a famous New York Times best-selling book called The Roosevelt Myth in 1948, a devastating critique of Franklin Roosevelt, which, of course, people should read. And conservatives love that book. The, the, the very mainstream conservative book club featured that book. So if you're going to criticize Ron Paul for liking a book by some guy, you're also criticizing pretty much the whole conservative movement. So, you know, nice job there, genius. And then in this section, we're told that People in Ron Paul's camp, like Jack Hunter, or me, or Mike Church, or anybody, but the reason we go after a radio host Mark Levin so often, which actually we don't, I mean, hardly ever criticize that guy, but the reason we do that, of course, is that he's Jewish. And boy, we just don't like Jewish people. Well, all right, well, a couple things. First, the reason I go after Mark Levin is that he's constantly attacking us. I mean, what am I supposed to do, just sit there? Uh, secondly... I don't go after uh, anybody like Levin or anybody else because these people are Jewish any more than I would go, I'd go after Murray Rothbard because he's Jewish. 
Uh, Murray Rothbard uh, and, and Ludwig von Mises and Walter Block and David Gordon are very important intellectual influences on Ron, Ron Paul. They're all Jewish. None of them get mentioned in the article. Well, Rothbard gets mentioned in a, in a ridiculous smear, but otherwise, no mention of them at all. So it's obviously not a Jewish thing. It's a matter of disagreement on principle. Because, in fact, I criticize all the other Republican primary candidates, and I call them neoconservatives, and none of them are Jewish. And, in fact, neither is Sean Hannity, whom I criticize, neither is Rick Santorum, I like to criticize quite a bit. But it's claimed that the, the very term neoconservative is like a code word that means Jewish. Ooh, right. Well, the problem with that is Norman Podhoretz preferred the term neoconservative. And secondly, as I say, most neocons are not Jewish. I mean, Bill Bennett, I mean, I could just go on and on and on talking about criticizing that. We're, we're having a disagreement over some issues. Why can't we just treat it on its merits instead of instead assuming that there are bad motives, that there are haters involved, and so on. Oh, and before moving on from the anti-Semitism issue, notice that the argument is that anti-interventionists must always be looking for some kind of a, a scapegoat, a boogeyman that's trying to push the United States into war, and so therefore anti-interventionists want to find and demonize that boogeyman. Well, that's obviously not necessary. But beyond that, let's turn the tables a bit here. I don't think people like Jeffrey Lord and the pro-war establishment that he represents are in much of a position to be lecturing other people about fomenting discord among peoples. And you think of the war propaganda that has accompanied every major U.S. intervention. Uh, this is not exactly designed to encourage uh, international understanding and human brotherhood, put it that way. So I would say that, you know, they say about people in glass houses. Now, finally, the last section of this piece is a laundry list of people Jeffrey Lord is shocked that some of Ron Paul's friends don't like. But yes, that's, that's what he's reduced to. Ron Paul knows a guy who runs a website that featured an article by a guy who doesn't like this other guy. Well, gee, well, Ron Paul better just uh, pack it in at this point. I cannot believe this is supposed to be some kind of killer argument. Now, there's no point in going through all of these, but, for example, Ronald Reagan. That's true that Lou Rockwell has an article by Murray Rothbard, a free market economist, in other words, the sort of person that you'd think a conservative might like, uh, critical of Reagan for not being free market enough. Well, according to Jeffrey Lord and Mark Levin, we're not supposed to say that. The Supreme Neocon Council has declared that Reagan was precisely just the right amount free market, down to the last thousandth of a percent. How dare you question that? What kind of bizarre pantheon of the gods are they expecting us to wave incense before here? So none of these people are, are subject to criticism. You can't criticize Bill Buckley, a magazine editor. You can't criticize him. Let's see, Sarah Palin. Oh, gee, a conservative can't criticize Sarah Palin. Two generations ago, Sarah Palin would have been laughed off the stage as an intellectual lightweight by any self-respecting conservative. Sean Hannity. Sean Hannity. Well, you can't criticize him as, a, as not being a conservative, right? Because he's Sean Hannity. Well, I remember being on TV with Sean Hannity and pointing out, as any conservative would know, by the way, that Franklin Roosevelt's New Deal did not get the country out of the Depression, but in fact prolonged it. And he said on the air that he had never heard, never heard that argument before. Not that he didn't agree with it, or he didn't know the source material. He'd never even heard that argument. And he's above reproach. Okay. And then Mark Levin. Well, I dealt with Mark Levin. You can check it out at tomwoods.com slash Levin. And you'll see exactly how that went. I dealt with him on the presidential war powers issue, and you see how he responded. I want you, I, unlike him, I link to every piece. I link to his piece, my response, his piece, my response. He doesn't do me the same courtesy, of course, to make it look like he's winning. But I show you everything, and you can see the way he debates, the same way he's, he's arguing with Mike Church right now. He, he just wrote a note to Mike Church on Facebook uh, saying, idiot and moron. I mean, like a, like a six-year-old. Right? And, and his fans are cheering this. Like, that is not, like, that's not very dignified, I'll just say, to the Levin fans. Like, you should actually be embarrassed by this. 
So in terms of Levin, well, I just recommend you look at TomWoods.com slash Levin. And in particular, you look at my challenge to Mark Levin, and then my last piece, how I sent Mark Levin home crying. And then you decide, looking at both sides, who won that particular exchange. All right, well, to, to close, I will remind people that Russell Kirk, again, the author of The Conservative Mind, a book that has gone through, I don't know, at least nine editions, was a seminal work in the post-war conservative uh, movement. Russell Kirk was an, an anti-interventionist who, in 1991, spoke out uh, very strongly against uh, U.S. foreign policy, because he felt like, if I can criticize U.S. domestic policy and still be an American in good standing, I'm pretty sure the same people who are carrying out this horrific domestic policy are the same people who are engaged in this terrible foreign policy, and I can criticize them as well. Uh, Kirk, of course, would not be allowed in the pages of the American Spectator if Jeffrey Lord had anything to say about it. I rather hope that the better elements of that magazine would have different thoughts. But for now, you can see that this attack on Ron Paul is not only a failure, it is a stupendous, astonishing, and pathetic failure.